Hi, I'm Shiv Kumar. Lee and I work on traffic infrastructure at Meta. Our talk today will start with introducing the edge layer, its traditional usage, and our global reach. We'll dive into opportunities and the challenges that the growth of AI and the advent of Metaverse bring to the edge layer. We'll showcase how we have been evolving and architecting our edge tier to leverage opportunities and overcome these challenges. Let's start with a product perspective. As you know, Facebook was founded in 2004 out of a desire to use the digital realm to drive connections in the real physical world. Our products have seamlessly blended interpersonal connectivity through messaging and beyond, promoted community building and commerce, and a whole lot more for a global user base of around 3 billion monthly users. Over time, the content that users share on our platforms has changed. We first started with text, which quickly evolved to photos, followed by the explosive growth of video content. And we now support really rich and immersive experiences in the metaverse. And this content continues to evolve. It wouldn't be a surprise if I claim that AI is the latest, hottest addition to this mix. And for the edge, this presents a new set of challenges. We are bringing complex models through a number of different surfaces, including AI agents in our messaging apps. AI obviously generates unique, non-cacheable content, which reduces the effectiveness of our highly scaled up CDN infrastructure. We'll soon talk about how we are evolving the edge hardware and our software capabilities to deal with this dynamic, fast-changing AI-generated content. Here's an outline of our talk. Now, I'll hand over to Lee to tell us more about the edge, its global reach, and associated complexities. Thanks, Shiv. So let's jump straight in, and let's talk about what does the edge at Meta do? As you can see here from the map, Meta operates one of the largest and most diverse internet serving infrastructures, interconnecting with hundreds of ISPs around the globe to serve content at planetary scale. We operate across more than 200 countries, and this infrastructure is the primary entry point to all of the Meta's family of apps. This terminates user connections on infrastructure close to those users. The green and blue dots represent our POPs and embedded caching appliances called MA. These live inside ISP networks, and we'll talk more about that shortly. This infrastructure provides an array of security services, including anti DDoS, rate limiting, and content authentication, all at the very edge of our network. This reach and diversity allows us a global average latency from user to edge of less than 40 milliseconds, driven by our global load balancing services, which optimize the user experience and placement onto the right infrastructure. Next, we'll talk more about this infrastructure. So let's examine the different layers of our edge hierarchy. So first we start with the, our data centers. This is our biggest and most complex piece, where we house millions of servers running services from databases to multimedia storage and to AI training, interconnected by our express backbone. This was specifically designed for efficiently carrying large volumes of machine-to-machine -machine traffic. You'll hear some of our backbone challenges in a later talk. Moving down the stack and physically closer to users are our edge metros. These are collections of pops in major cities around the world, and they act as the front door to our infrastructure. These are interconnected with hundreds of ISPs, and they terminate user sessions. These are interconnected by our edge backbone. This edge backbone extends to bridge our edge metros back to our data centers. To serve the hundreds of terabits of traffic toward users, we also have the next tier of our edge called MA, or Meta Network Appliance. MA is our embedded caching program for ISPs. With well over 7,000 clusters across the globe, they accelerate the delivery of static content, reduce backhaul demand, and also help us buffer against surges in popular content. Tying all of this to the product evolution that Shiv talked about earlier, MAs have been hugely successful in our CDN delivering static content like pictures, videos, and even live video. They, however, are not a generic compute platform. We'll talk more later about our machine types on the edge, but first, let's start by looking under the hood of one of our edge metros. We call our edge network the Elastic Edge Network, built out of building blocks to help us scale based on demand. First, we start with the peering layer. This is the true edge of the network. This is where we interconnect our ISP partners across multiple routers, often across multiple buildings, for reach, resilience, and scale. We, of course, encourage our peers to have multiple links to us across this infrastructure. 
Next, we have our compute layers. We start with the CDN. This is machines focused on caching popular content and proxying user connections back to backends that live in our data centers. Secondly, we have Edge Cloud. This is our evolving and growing fleet of machines, which are for compute heavy workloads. These include GPUs. Primary workloads today are metaverse and evolving to AI. These are built in logical clusters interconnected by a high capacity layer three fabric to allow any to any connectivity. Next is our aggregation layer. These ASWs or aggregation switches act as aggregation for the Metro, allowing each cluster to reach each other cluster, also to reach all of our peers. And lastly, we have the edge backbone. This backbone is used to interconnect our edge metros and also connect back to the data center. This also connects into the aggregation layer. This all comes together to build a multi-degree architecture that can scale as demands do. We can go from a single site to multiple sites. This is all complemented by in-house systems to deal with inventory, provisioning, management of machines, and of course, maintenance. We have tight feedback loops that talk to our global and local load balancing that can ensure fast reaction times to failures in the network or optimizing for traffic demands. So as we talked about, we have an evolving set of use cases at the edge, from content delivery for Facebook and Instagram to messaging, the metaverse, and now AI. The paradigm is shifting towards compute-intensive workloads needed to be closer to people. Geography and physics are as important to this as protocol optimizations. M&A was focused on being a hugely successful caching platform, offloading huge volumes of traffic for ISPs, but these aren't suitable for GPUs. Our primary metric here is watts of energy consumed versus gigabits offloaded. M&A was traditionally the closest point of infrastructure to users in many, many markets. Now that demands are starting to shift, we're having to think about this differently. Back to the Elastic Edge Network being an enabler. Originally designed for scale that we now call medium, large, and extra large, we've now developed a small version. This can be upgraded between different scales without a huge forklift being required, replacing all of the devices. The small version is actually quite large now, given the prevalence of 100 gig and 400 gig density in today's network devices, aimed at developing markets, but of course, not just developing markets like Africa, but more third and fourth tier interconnection markets outside of the NFL cities, even here in the US. Small deployments are a starting point, built of a small number of compute racks, plus smaller network gear. Think here pizza boxes versus giant refrigerator sized routers. Small deployments can cause issue, of course, easily overwhelmed by spikes in demand. We keep these within acceptable utilization targets with our global load balancing and workload placement. Shiv will talk about this more later. So as I said, locality is key. Bringing compute resources closer to users is obviously very important. So now we need to look at the different compute resources we need. So alongside building smaller publications, we're now introducing different compute types at the edge. Traditional reasons for entering a market would be offloading CDN traffic and bringing user termination closer. This offloads huge volume. Our expansion criteria, however, is evolving. Now that we have these lower latency content generation tasks, such as metaverse applications and AI, we're evolving how we evaluate new markets. What you can see here is a traditional serving path from a GPU in one of our origin data centers, proxy throughout one of our edge metros out to users. We've spent the last few years building dedicated compute and GPU infrastructure at the edge. Now with a mix of our large metros and these new small pops, we're moving the compute infrastructure closer to the edge and closer to people, further localizing the content generation. As I mentioned, we're evolving our evaluation criteria for new deployments, considering pops where we traditionally have sold with M&A. It's of course a balance between use cases being on the edge that really need low latency to users versus using our huge data centers, which have very different cost bases and economics due to their scale. Edge follows the sun, so there are opportunities for opportunistic, off-peak workloads using compute when users in that geography are asleep. Of course, even further distributed workloads means complexity in fleet management, orchestration, and of course, placement. It's easy to overwhelm small infrastructure with user traffic. Let me hand back to Shiv, who can talk to you more about some of the things we're doing in this space. Thanks, Lee. Now, let's look at what it takes to provide computation and AI inference on the edge. Let's again apply the product perspective to see how we use the edge compute layer. Expanding on what we saw earlier, we currently support four categories of applications. The metaverse is Meta's virtual reality offering. The low latency reach of edge clusters offers a convenient medium to host interactive virtual worlds 
and build immersive experiences. Our products like WhatsApp have launched AI agents that converse, provide recommendations, and even engage in interactive dialogue. We are now exploring building inference capabilities on the edge to enable low latency interactions and to conserve our precious network backbone bandwidth. Connection latencies are obviously crucial to any gameplay experience. This makes gaming a natural use case to run on the edge. Wearables like AR VR devices and smart glasses are limited by their power, on device storage, and have other constraints. The computing needs of these devices is increasing in complexity. We are starting to use the edge tier to offload compute, stream content, and render graphics. Now, let's look at the common challenges for all of these use cases. Offering a general purpose compute or running AI inference on a globally distributed edge that Lee just outlined creates novel challenges and requires innovative solutions and capabilities. User requests need to be routed to appropriate compute clusters globally in real time while satisfying complex placement criteria and constraints. This means deciding which workload runs on which cluster is not straightforward. The edge hosts are located much closer to the public internet and hence require higher scrutiny of ingress and egress traffic. This coupled with having to run a mix of first party and third party application code presents an increased threat surface requiring strict tenancy and access controls. Our edge fleet is heterogeneous with different SKUs of hardware and software complements. In effect, not every cluster or every machine can support all of the four categories of application requests that we just saw. An application can consume varying amounts of hardware resources over time and require specialized firmware or device driver configurations. This requires the edge fleet to be managed efficiently. We will examine each of these challenges and our solutions over the next few slides. Let's start with orchestration and placement. With a fleet and a user base that are both globally distributed, matching the user request to an optimally placed cluster is very important. In comparison, CDNs tend to have a globally homogeneous setup and if a request gets sent to a suboptimal location, it still successfully serves the request with just a slightly higher latency. Here's a scenario of it being done inefficiently. As you can see, it takes four round trips to find the optimal cluster. What this means is edge compute introduces additional constraints like hardware affinity constraints, meaning certain workloads can only run on specific GPUs. We have experience constraints like applications requiring certain latency, bandwidth, or geolocation needs. We have resource constraints with VMs having to be warm to serve traffic, and applications like Metaverse or gaming tend to have long sticky running connections, which introduces persistence as a constraint. This makes it a multi-dimensional optimization and scheduling problem. To solve for this, we have built a series of scheduling systems. We use a primary targeting system that identifies viable regions based on the user's location, connection latencies, currently available compute capacity. And then we use the output of this system through a secondary scheduling system that dynamically satisfies for the hardware, the experience, and the resource constraints to perform subfiltering of the clusters and then resolve the request to the most optimal host and VM. Now let's look at the workloads and the environment itself. So what's really unique about computing or inference on the edge? Edge machines reside outside of Meta's flow and access control mechanisms like rate limiters, proxies, and much more. And this can pose security risks. This then makes the compute environment itself untrustworthy. On the host itself, Applications could be third-party applications like games developed by external developers or first-party applications can rely on third-party middleware or 
have open source dependencies. The metaverse or AI inference is a good example. This makes the workloads untrustworthy as well. To solve for this, we employ a host of solutions. We mark edge hosts at an off-net isolation level and treat them as completely untrusted environments. This means we do not store any information on them. We use VM isolation to tighten up security and have strict network authentication and authorization to deter network sniffing. We also employ several security measures and intrusion detection system and a whole lot more. To top it all, we selectively enable data center access from the edge. To manage the workloads themselves, we have engineered a network isolation perimeter to create boundaries between different trust levels and have overlay networks in place to segregate the flat physical network. Now let's look at how do we manage our fleet. Managing a fleet of more than 100,000 GPUs is a scale challenge. Different SKUs means not every host can support every workload. Use cases tend to grow and shrink across machines or even across clusters as the product demand changes and this requires frequent rebalancing. Applications tend to customize these machines with specialized firmware or device drivers. This then requires reimaging and active host management. And just like any other infrastructure, we do need to support maintenances, drains, upgrades, and in general upkeep of a remotely located fleet. To solve for these problems, we have built a demand forecasting system to predict expected demand to the order of next tens of minutes to a few hours. We use this to allow applications to customize and prepare their hosts ahead of the actual demand. In addition, we have also built an edge autoscaler system to order and prioritize the workloads per business value and to spin up or down instances as the demand changes. These software solutions tackle demand control and prediction, but the need for hardware heterogeneity is making us redesign our shape or the makeup of our edge machines. Let's go back to Lee to have him take us through the machine shape evolution. Thanks, Shiv. So let's talk about machine shapes. The traditional CDN use case meant we needed a balance of CPU, memory, network, and disk. This served us well for a good number of years. This helped us scale during the video boom and also allowed us to have a uniform machine pool across the edge. Evolving use cases like Metaverse and AI are making us think differently. Our first introduction of a new machine shape on the edge was the introduction of a graphics rendering machine. This includes graphics GPUs aimed at gaming and Metaverse applications. Now, as Shiv talked about earlier, AI is generating lots of content which is very unique. It's far less cacheable. So now we're introducing a machine with much more disk, lots of NVMe flash so that we can keep up with new demands. And lastly, as we start to think about inferencing on the edge, there's a potential need for a machine with much more powerful GPUs. Our current GPU is very focused on graphics rendering, less so on inferencing. We now need to shift that paradigm as we start to think about different use cases. And so to recap, we're evolving our edge to go beyond content and connections to also include compute. Where mobile clients are getting more powerful, compute needs, especially for AI, are growing exponentially. Edge offers a hybrid model to offload client compute. We're architecting our edge towards a future of conversational AI and to host stateless applications. So what's next? Of course, it's not all done. Our hardware complement is growing. We're developing more machine types as use cases expand. GPUs are solving for graphics rendering first and inferencing later. Our edge fleet continues to expand, opening up into new markets and enabling new lower latency real-time experiences and cloud offload. We continue to focus on our edge developer ecosystem, building our internal tools and systems to help our internal developers have the ability to seamlessly move workloads back and forth between the edge and our data centers where it makes sense. Thank you.